HDSA in Maine. Earlier this month in HD 101, Dr. Martha Nance from our HDSA Center of Excellence at Hennepin Healthcare gave us a refresher on the typical symptoms of Huntington's disease. Today in HD 202, she'll focus on the care needs of people with Huntington's disease as the disease progresses and how to optimize daily life throughout the course of the disease. This three-part series wraps up on June 17th when HD 303 will examine our hopes and goals for the future and how the HD medical research and advocacy communities can work together to achieve better lives for people with HD and their families. You can register for the final session by going to hdsa.org slash hdsame. All hdsame webinars are available on HDSA's YouTube channel about a week after broadcast. As a reminder, you can send a question at any time during the presentation. Just click on the chat function in the toolbar, type your question and press enter. Your question will be answered at the end of the session. And now a little about our speaker. Dr. Martha Nance is a neurologist and geneticist who has served as medical director of the HDSA Center of Excellence at Hennepin Healthcare in Minneapolis, Minnesota since 1991. She's an active clinician and has also participated in many HD clinical trials, as well as serving on the executive committee of the Huntington Study Group twice. She co-authored A Physician's Guide to the Management of Huntington's Disease, third edition, and wrote the Juvenile HD Handbook, both published by HDSA. He is particularly interested in genetic testing, juvenile HD, and care of late stage HD. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Nance here today, and I'll turn the broadcast over to her. Thank you, Deb. It's a pleasure to be back and to, to move on from um, HD 101 to HD 202, which I titled, In the Midst of It. Um, so this is really, you know, after kind of a refresher of sort of the basics about Huntington's disease, what, what, how do you move forward? How do you deal with Huntington's disease as you go through the course of the disease? Um, uh, and I, I would um, emphasize this disclaimer that uh, anything that I say that sounds like Dr. Nance says I should do this or that, um, is not a command. Um, it's, it's really a, a general suggestion and any treatments, therapies, drugs, et cetera, you should, you should take up with your own physician um, yeah, and not take it as uh, gospel that this is the thing that you should do. Um, in terms of my disclosures, I um, have done, I've been involved with a number of companies doing um, uh, HD research and I'm on the steering committee for Connect HD uh, which I will mention very briefly um, during the presentation. So today we're going to talk about, um, you know, wh why and when to go to a doctor and what, do, what does the doctor do and how do you manage symptoms, but, uh, but actually more importantly, how do you manage the challenges of early Huntington's disease? Um, how do you sort of create a care team how do you plan for the future? What, what can you do to help yourself? Um, I think often after a diagnosis of Huntington's disease, there's a sense of um, loss uh, and, and losing function, losing control. The disease itself takes, takes away your ability to control your movements. But what can you actually do to help yourself? And just a, a few comments to the other family members, spouses and children who are helping people with Huntington's disease. And then we'll spend a little bit of time at the end on, on uh, how the disease progresses and, um, and revisiting the, the care team as the, as the disease progresses. There should be time for questions. So, so please, if things I say are not clear or, um, or you have uh, suggestions or ideas, uh, say so. Um, I showed I, 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 some of the slides I'm showing today, I showed at the last um, presentation, some of the details are a little bit changed. Um, but doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals tend to think in terms of symptoms. So what are the symptoms of early Huntington's disease? And we are taught to think in terms of movement symptoms and cognitive or memory symptoms and mood or behavioral symptoms. And then uh, what you might call metabolic symptoms. So the movement symptoms includes things like chorea, but also incoordination, trouble with speech, which we call dysarthria, trouble swallowing, which we call dysphagia, um, changes in thinking and memory. Um, often the earliest features are changes in the 
the sort of overall organizing and planning and decision making things we refer to as executive functions. But as time goes on, there's trouble learning um, and learning new things and perhaps even trouble remembering old things. One of the big issues that we run into um, uh, can be a big issue even getting to the doctor and getting to a diagnosis is a tendency for patients to have either a, an unawareness of their symptoms or a, um, a deep rooted denial of their symptoms. And how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and then in terms of mood and behavioral symptoms, depression, anxiety, uh, one of the big issues is often impulsiveness or irritability. And then a lot of our patients um, at some point in the disease, and it can be very early in the course, will tend to lose weight. Um, and a lot of patients complain of being hot. Um, so those are symptoms, but then there, there's symptoms and then there's challenges. And I think often when patients or families come to the clinic for the first time, it's because there are challenges, not so much, you know, I have this much chorea or that much trouble standing on one foot. It's I'm having trouble at work. I'm having trouble managing my whole sort of household affairs. Our, our relationship, our, my spouse and I are at each other's throats. Um, changes in mood or anxiety. Gee, I've always been a little bit depressed, but man, now it's just really sticky and deep and I can't, I can't get rid of it. Um, sometimes uh, families uh, uh, bring a person in because they're scared of the person's driving. And you know how that one goes. The patient always thinks they're fine and the, and the family doesn't. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the unawareness of symptoms of somebody's just kind of bumbling along and not, not really even realizing that there's a problem when everyone else is well aware of it. So wh why would you go to a doctor? What does the medical team do? Um, one would hope that the medical team can help in a timely fashion get to an accurate diagnosis. Um, sometimes for me, if it's a patient coming from a family that I know well, um, particularly if I have seen, you know, sometimes um, kids grow up from being little kids to being adults, and I've seen them over the years uh, as they help their parent, and then 10 years later, they come to the clinic because they themselves are having symptoms. For me, it's pretty easy to make a diagnosis at that point. If I know the family well, I know that person from years past, and I can see the movement changes or the cognitive changes, it's, I can pretty quickly get to the diagnosis. Let's just do a gene test to confirm. Um, but if it's a family I don't know, or a patient I don't know, or there's no family history of Huntington's disease, sometimes it takes a little longer to actually get to a diagnosis. The gene test has really helped us to, to get to an accurate diagnosis. So um, if you think about it the other way around, you can absolutely rule out Huntington's disease if it's not there. If the gene test is normal, then whatever you've got is not Huntington's disease. If you have an abnormal gene test, then you, you will someday develop Huntington's disease. If your symptoms look like those of Huntington's disease, then, then I think we've probably gotten to the answer. I find it very useful to do baseline assessments um, of a number of different things. So this is a disease that's gonna progress over time. Um, how are you functioning now cognitively? How are you functioning currently in terms of motor function? How is your swallowing? How is your communication? How is your uh, mood? So even if these things are pretty good, it's kind of nice to document that they're pretty good. Um, and if there's a problem in some area, let's document how significant a, a change there is and start addressing it. There are medications, but um, more importantly, non-medication treatments for many of the symptoms of Huntington's disease. So again, as I said, medical teams um, tend to think of symptoms. So what symptoms are there that we can actually um, fix or improve? Um, but uh, as I said in the last slide, the, the bigger issue for patients and families is some of these challenges that may not map directly onto a specific symptom. Often when, when we see somebody for the first time in the clinic, it's because some kind of crisis has arisen. Um, patients don't, often don't walk in the door the first time they notice just a little bit of chorea. They come in the door when there's some kind of crisis and they need a diagnosis in order to get on disability or they're not able to manage the family okay or they're driving unsafely and so on. It's really important to, to educate. Um, this is, uh, I'm preaching to the choir here. You, you are all here um, being educated. 
there still is a lot of misunderstanding about Huntington's disease, symptoms, progression, genetics. Um, there still is a stigma, I think, in many families or communities associated with, with um, having Huntington's disease, so we don't talk about it in our family. Um, well, let's talk about it. You know, you need to know what the disease is, what to expect, um, what the time frame is, um, and, and who's going to do what to help you. And along those lines, uh, to plan for the future, um, obviously the best time to plan for the future is now. Um, so let's get over that sort of hump of the diagnosis and start uh, planning for how we're going to manage this over time. And then it, I, I think it's really important for a, a person with Huntington's disease to, to uh, create a community, whether that's your family um, or the medical community that's going to be there to support you. Um, so I, both parties can reach towards each other. Um, we try to reach out to patients and families as best as we can with our whole team. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, where you don't have a center of excellence, the burden may be a little bit more on you, the patient or family, to um, uh, really build a relationship with a provider that, that is um, forward thinking and willing and able to work with you. The, the real goal in my view is to be proactive rather than reactive. It should not come as a surprise if somebody with Huntington's disease eventually isn't working or isn't driving or needs uh, somebody else to prepare meals or, or to uh, manage the uh, financial affairs. All these things are to be expected. And so let's talk about them ahead of time. How is it gonna change your living situation if you can't drive anymore? Um, who's gonna be there to, to make sure you take your pills on time or, or get meals if, if you're getting forgetful about those things? So let's plan ahead. So back to kind of the doctor and, and medical model sort of thing, how do we manage symptoms in early Huntington's disease? Um, and as I said, the, the, we, I, I often sort of lump different uh, symptoms into different subgroups. So there are movement symptoms. We have medications to treat the, the chorea, the involuntary movements um, in Huntington's disease. Um, the two drugs that are specifically approved to treat chorea in Huntington's disease are tetrabenazine and deuterated tetrabenazine. Um, there is a uh, study going on right this minute that everybody should rush out and sign up for as soon as this uh, talk is over. A study called Connect HD, which is looking at a third drug in that same category is very similar to tetrabenazine and dutetrabenazine, a drug called valbenazine. And this is the study to, to document um, whether valbrenazine works uh, equally well or better than the other drugs uh, at treating Korea. This particular study is really struggling to enroll enough um, subjects. Um, and if I were a member of the HD community, I would be really unhappy if we didn't get to a third drug for Korea because 10 too few people signed up for the study, and so it was a failed study. Um, the drug was fine, probably, but, but not enough people signed up for the study, and so it was not able to, to um, have a statistical significance. So Connect HD is trying to enroll all its um, uh, participants by the end of May, <laughs> or maybe the middle of June. So, so, um, so you have to get on the phone quickly if you wanna be in that study. Um, we do not have uh, uh, medications that fix the lack of coordination, which we did, uh, but we don't. However, um, if you have a disease that's taking away your ability to control your movements, how might you um, fight that disease? Well, by making a point of doing controlled movements. So, and I don't care whether that's yoga or playing basketball or out in Minnesota, everybody plays pickleball. Um, so, but you need to be active. The more that you move, the more that you work on exercise and maintain your strength and stamina, um, the better your coordination will be for longer. Um, occupational therapy can help think about things that you do with your, with your hands. So if your coordination troubles are getting in the way of um, uh, preparing your meals or bathing, dressing, those sorts of things, um, OT can often help uh, think through what kinds of equipment or safety measures might be uh, helpful. 
Speech therapy talks about the act of speaking and also swallowing. Those are two different things you do with the same muscles. And so, so often the same, uh, the same person may have trouble in both arenas um, with both um, speech and swallowing. So let's evaluate it. Let's get a baseline. Let's, let's talk about the mechanics of swallowing and how Huntington's disease is going to affect that so that we postpone the time that you have start to have any choking troubles. Um, and did I mention exercise? Yeah, exercise is good. So get out there and move. Um, now that the gyms are opening up and now that it's summertime, uh, the, the more that you stay active, the healthier you will be for longer. What about managing memory symptoms? Well, um, there are pills on the market to treat Alzheimer's disease, which I uh, do not expect to be helpful in somebody with Huntington's disease because chemically, what's going on in the brain in those two diseases is, is too, it's very different. So we don't have any pills at the moment um, to treat the, specifically treat the memory changes in Huntington's disease. Um, but you know, it's really important, particularly when somebody's new uh, to, to, the, um, to the disease, to the diagnosis, to have a sense of the baseline. What, what are you like now um, at this point in the disease? Um, how well are you functioning? Um, what kinds of things are you having trouble with? The neuropsychologist can also help um, both the patient and the family to think about ways to use your cognitive strengths to sort of work around your cognitive weaknesses. Um, so some people are better at verbal skills than others, and some people are better, you know, those little things where you have to manipulate a drawing of a three-dimensional object and figure out what it looks like if you turn it upside down. Um, uh, so somebody who's an architect or an artist might be really good at, at, at those kind of activities. How can you use your strengths to get around your, your weaknesses? Or are there certain um, uh, duties either at home or at work that you really just should not be expected to do anymore? Um, how can we adjust um, what or how you do your work um, so that you can be successful and stay on the job for longer? Or if you really can't stay on the job, the, the cognitive testing often um, really helps to support a disability claim. Um, what about mood? Um, there are many medications for many uh, sort of mood or, or um, uh, emotional symptoms, depression, anxiety, uh, irritability, impulsiveness, sleep distor disturbances, um, paranoid thinking. Um, so again, these are things we need to talk about and address and, and not sort of hide. And then finally, I have all of my patients see the dietitian on day one um, to really, um, again, do an assessment of uh, how are you doing with your nutrition currently, both in terms of what's your weight and what's the ideal weight, but also what kinds of foods are you eating? And, um, and and how can we, so some of our patients need to increase their calorie intake. Um, yay, first time ever a doctor ever told you to increase your calorie intake. You know, so, so let's think about, are you underweight? Are you right where you belong? Are you eating healthy food? Do you need a little bit more calories? Um, and so, so the dietitian can be very helpful in um, getting people off on the right track with their nutrition. So those are symptoms that we manage, but what about the challenges? So patients often come to us, families come to us because there's a, a, a life challenge. Um, one of the big ones as uh, Huntington's begins is disability. Um, that often is the issue. Um, the first time I meet a patient, uh, I actually just saw somebody yesterday where this was the, the big issue. Um, the, um, the mere diagnosis of Huntington's disease does not instantly qualify somebody for disability. Um, there has to be some impact of your Huntington's disease on your ability to do your work. Um, so there is some strategy involved in disability. Uh, you, the, the thing you kind of don't want to do is to say, oh, you know what, it's getting hard to work. So I think I'm gonna go to half time and see if I can't work half time for a couple more years. Uh, and then I'll go on disability after that. The problem with that is that then you're disabled from your half-time job. Um, and so you get half the income that you would have had if you were disabled from your full-time job um, two years earlier. So there's a little bit of 
strategy involved. There, there are some people who are way too stoic and overachieving and, you know, want to somehow keep hanging on to some amount of work as long as they possibly can. And that, that may not be in your best interest financially. Um, HDSA has a disability counselor who can be, be very helpful in, in working through this with you. Um, and the Centers of Excellence will all have a social worker who, who may know more about the sort of local um, uh, or may have more local resources to help you. The Social Security disability um, uh, typically requires a gene test just so that there's no question about whether you do or don't in fact have the disease from which you think you're being disabled. Um, and if you're if there is any cognitive component to the work that you do, uh, I, I really think it's very helpful to have formal cognitive testing or what they call neuropsychometric or neuropsychological testing. <clears throat> the office exam of thinking and memory is very superficial. Um, I always say if my patient shows up for an appointment on time and has the same color socks on both feet, they're probably doing pretty well um, in my book. Um, uh, but there are subtler changes in cognition that can absolutely impact on a person's ability to work successfully, particularly if there is any cognitive component to the work that they do. So I, again, in anybody who's, who's really pursuing disability, the patient I saw yesterday, I said, let's, let's go get formal neuropsychological testing. The other thing you have to think about when you retire is what in the heck are you going to do when you retire? And you need an exit plan. And this is really difficult um, uh, in part because of the typical onset age and age of disability of people with Huntington's disease and the impact it has on the family. So if, if, if I go on disability, then my spouse is gonna end up working two jobs uh, to try to keep food on the table and a roof overhead and I can't drive anymore. So now I'm just trapped in my house. Well, in Minnesota, where I live, that's a huge issue. There's no, there's no way to get anywhere in Minnesota other than in a car. Um, in New York City, it might not be such a big deal because you just hop on the subway and, and go to the gym. But in, in Minnesota, it's a big issue. H how are you going to get places um, if you're not working or particularly if you're not driving? And by the way, all your friends and colleagues, a lot of them are, are work-related. So who, how are you going to have social interactions um, when you retire? I think that really is important to think about as you're approaching disability. What about managing home affairs? Well, occupational therapy can um, uh, think about safety, can think about equipment needs. Um, the social worker or uh, some people need family counseling. There are county social services to be accessed. So again, I often have people see both OT and social work. If there's question about, say for instance, it's a parent, a, a mother of small children being diagnosed with Huntington's disease and there's question about the person's ability to, to really juggle all those household affairs, getting the kids to school, getting the baby fed, um, let's, let's get the county social services involved um, to, to support the family and the children. What about unsafe driving? <laughs> That's a challenge. Um, I think it is important to talk about it early um, so that, again, we are proactive about the idea. You've got a disease that is going to impact on your ability to drive at some point. Um, how are you going to get places if you can't drive? Um, in my large city, um, we have a couple of things. We have occupational therapists who can do kind of an office, sort of a video game screening of um, driving skills. And depending on how a person does on that uh, OT screen, they may say, well, you really need a behind the wheel test. And I, I often phrase it that, you know, the, the burden is on you, the person who has Huntington's disease, to document, to prove that you still do have the ability to drive, um, even though you have this disease that's going to affect your control of your movements and your ability to make rapid decisions. So if you wanna keep on driving, then you're gonna to have to at least go through this OT eval every couple of years um, or more often if we need to, um, to show that you still do have the ability to drive. It is a very contentious thing where I am and I've had um, terrible things happen in both directions. Um, I had one patient once, it wasn't a Huntington's patient, but who drove for one day too long 
and uh, T-boned another guy um, who didn't live through it. Um, I also had a patient who I said, you know, you really shouldn't be driving anymore. Um, and he got upset and I said, well, okay, fine. Why don't you go do this OT behind the wheel thing? I will, I will not send a letter to the state yet. I'll give you a month. And if you produce a letter in a month from, from a behind the wheel of Al saying that you're okay, then you're okay. Um, and he bought a gun 29 days later and shot himself. Um, and fortunately didn't um, shoot himself fatally. Um, but I, so it, it is a very contentious issue. It's something I'm sensitive about in both directions because over my long career, I've had uh, terrible things happen both ways. About relationship changes, um, you know, psychology, family counseling, um, and sort of really working with the whole family to understand what the person with Huntington's disease can do, what they can't do, um, what the expectations should be, and how to sort of work around them. Unawareness of symptoms is a is a very difficult thing to to um, deal with. The comment I make is that there are often different layers of unawareness. So I've, I've had patients where you could um, ask them, how's their Huntington's disease? And they say, well, I don't have Huntington's disease. And I say, well, how are these movements you have? And they say, well, you know, my movements are a little bit worse and I hear there's some medicine for it. So lo and behold, I'm able to treat Korea as long as, as, long as I just don't use the H word. Um, or if there's a sleep problem or a mood problem, we can address symptoms sometimes even if the patient doesn't really acknowledge having the disease. And then there are times where uh, families come to us in a, in a severe psychiatric crisis of some kind. And, um, and I have to um, ask for the help of my psychiatry colleagues to help in those circumstances, um, even though the psychiatrist may not be uh, technically part of the HD clinic. Um, if, the, if we're in a psychiatric crisis, um, we just need somebody who's an expert in managing psychiatric crisis to help us. Um, uh, and maybe the person needs to be in the hospital. It may involve social services. It could involve law enforcement. It could involve the legal system. So, so, um, so uh, sort of a different um, set of um, uh, medical professionals often has to help us out when we're in the setting of a severe psychiatric crisis. So I showed this slide in the last talk and I called it um, building a care team. This time I'm calling it navigating the healthcare system. So um, if you come to my center at, at, uh, in Minneapolis, these are all the people available to you. Neurology, psychology, neuropsychology, genetic counselor, social worker, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, dietitian, a nurse, a research nurse. Um, if you don't go to a center of excellence, you, you may have to um, urge or assist your um, physician in allowing you to build a care team. Um, so, you know, gee, I hear that the physical therapist should be seeing people with, with Huntington's disease because there's exercises to be done to maintain my strength. Could you please refer me to physical therapy? And you know, yes, you may end up seeing a physical therapist who doesn't, quote, know Huntington's disease, but presumably they know physical therapy and they know about neurologic conditions and they know about, um, about the importance of staying fit and, and exercise. Um, and they can access literature on the topic. So again, um, I often uh, encourage uh, families to acquire a copy of the Physician's Guide, which has chapters about um, about some of these uh, um, allied health professionals and their role in helping people with Huntington's disease. Speech therapy, you know, I'm having a little bit of choking. Uh, should I see a, a speech therapist early to evaluate that before it gets to be a bigger problem? And so on and so on. Um, and, you know, you, you may have to ask for these things or ask for a referral to a genetic counselor or suggest that you went to this webinar and you think you need to have formal cognitive testing before applying for disability. So, that, so you know, write down all the names of all these different healthcare professionals and if or as you need them, um, make, you know, help your doctor to, to help you access them. 
then planning for the future, I, I, did I say this before about 10 times about the, you know, if, if, if we really do our job right, we are proactive. So the family, you know, will help hopefully the person with Huntington's disease, there are HDSA resources, there's HDCOE uh, social workers. You may want to just have an elder uh, law attorney help with, with some of the planning. So there's financial planning, there's legal planning, there's healthcare planning. Um, I don't know much about financial and legal planning. I know more about the healthcare planning. So, you know, it, it really is important for people with Huntington's disease to have a, um, what we sometimes call living will or a um, advanced healthcare directive. So that um, if or when the time comes that you're not really able to articulate clearly what, what you would like for your medical care that someone else is specifically assigned to um, speak for you. Um, uh, there's another kind of document called a POLST. It goes by different names in different states. Um, but the POLST is a, it, it, it's what it's called in Minnesota, the Physician Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It's kind of a more um, detailed or sort of specific version of a, of a healthcare directive that talks about specific kinds of um, medical treatments that you, that you either would or would not want to have. And the other difference in a POLST is in the end it's signed by the, by the physician um, or the healthcare provider. And, so it so the things written on the polls come through as a as a doctor's order, and that's a little bit easier for EMTs and emergency room doctors and so on to interpret. Sometimes we struggle with a healthcare directive that says something like, "Don't do anything heroic if there's no chance of recovery," or sometimes a healthcare directive says, "My son will make the right decisions for me," um, and. And we sometimes struggle with that in, in, a, in a healthcare setting in an emergency where the pulse uh, says, you know, I do not want a feeding tube. I do not want uh, to be intubated. I do not want to go to the hospital if I am sick. Um, so for some people, particularly farther down the road with, with, the, with a neurodegenerative disease, a pulse may become appropriate. And then there's, um, as you do your healthcare planning, thinking about what community resources are, uh, do you need now or might you need in the future and how do you access them? Um, uh, what about living outside the home? Um, if, if there's a sense that, that, that a decision is gonna have to be made about something like that within the next couple of years, um, you really don't wanna wait until a crisis comes up and all of a sudden the person with Huntington's disease has fallen and broken their hip and simply cannot be at home, uh, and nobody's ever thought about it before. Um, sometimes it's helpful to be thinking, where would you go if if you if if you couldn't be at home? What are your options? And of all of the options, none of which are what you really want. What would be the best choice of all these options that you don't like? Because um, if you don't make plans and something bad happens, you just get put wherever there's an opening. And that's, that's a less pleasant way of uh, making a move outside the home. I showed this slide in the last presentation, but um, for some reason I think it's important, so I'll say it again. What can you do to help yourself now that you're diagnosed with Huntington's disease? Number one, you eat right. Number two, you drink enough fluids. Number three, you exercise. Number four, you rest when you need to. Number five, do things that you like to do as long as they're legal. And number six, um, you will do better if you're surrounded by people that you care about and that care about you. Um, and it's amazing how many people cannot check all those six boxes, including probably half of your medical care team. <laughs> um, so there's plenty for you to work on. There's plenty for me to work on on this, on this list of, of things that I, I can be doing to help myself. So get to work. What else can you do um, in, uh, in the setting of Huntington's disease? Learning about Huntington's disease is important. Knowledge is power. Um, if you know what you're getting into, it's, it's a much easier um, step through the door than if you're scared to death and have no idea what's coming next. Um, participate in research. Um, unless you are content that we have all the right treatments for Huntington's disease, uh, which hopefully nobody in the room is, um, 
we need to find better treatments, but the doctors can't do it without you and you can't do it without the physician researchers. So let's work together um, on developing better treatments for Huntington's disease. Um, you are uniquely qualified to help us uh, improve the, the care of people with Huntington's disease for, for, um, for the future generations. Um, I said it before, to be proactive, make plans, not worries. Um, so lying awake all night worrying about what would happen if such and such uh, occurred, that doesn't help very much. Um, much better to sit down and talk about it and figure out what, what would the family's plan be if, if you couldn't take care of the kids anymore or if you fall and injure yourself, what, what, what would you do under those circumstances? And I've said this one before too, but I really wanna emphasize that you have to let other people in. You just cannot go through the whole course of Huntington's disease by yourself. You just can't, <laughs> it doesn't work. At some point you need, you need help, you need assistance. And, and so if you've burned bridges with family members, maybe you try to um, rebuild the bridges. Um, who's, who's really gonna be there to, to support you? And maybe you do some nice things for them now um, so they feel good about helping you down the road. What about thoughts for, for spouses and children and other family members? This is not easy. Um, in, it's, it's, I, I think in some ways it's almost harder to be somebody who cares about a person who has a health problem because you feel so impotent. There's, there's there, you know, if you have a child with Huntington's disease, you just wanna suck the disease out of them and, you know, take me, <laughs> um, you know, don't hurt my child. Um, or a spouse. Um, so this is hard, it is not easy. Um, but you have to, as they say, <laughs> has a new meaning now, put on your own mask before assisting others. You have to take care of your own physical health, your mental health, your spiritual health. You cannot help somebody else if you are profoundly depressed. You cannot help somebody else if you put off getting your knee replacement and your hip replacement and you can't hardly even walk. How are you gonna pick somebody else up who falls if you can't walk yourself? It really helps for you to be knowledgeable. So, so sometimes the person with Huntington's disease really doesn't want to go to a conference or a talk or a convention. It doesn't mean you can't go. So feel free to go. If, if you have a, a cousin, sibling, parent, spouse, child with Huntington's disease, you go to the conferences and meetings and become knowledgeable. If you need, if you need help, get help. Um, uh, care, um, family members are marvelous advocates. Um, if there's anybody that feels the urgency um, of Huntington's disease, it's somebody watching their loved one um, uh, go through the course of Huntington's disease um, with their own eyes. Um, so advocate, participate. Sometimes as you're caring for somebody, you have to set priorities. Um, what is the main priority? Um, if you had to <laughs> choose I often uh, give this lecture to, to my um, young physicians, put the following in order of importance, and you can't say they're all important. You have to put them in order. Um, yourself, your work, your spouse, your kids. So which one of those things takes priority um, when push comes to shove? Uh, and, and if you make priorities, um, you, you have to live with them. So I, I know for myself when I had kids at home and I was a physician and I was a wife and I, you know, all these things um, and I worked, um, the kids were the top priority. I mean, if, if I had three calls at once and it was my spouse wanting to go to a movie and it was somebody wanting me to um, take care of a patient and it was the school saying my kid was sick, I had to go pick him up, which one would I do? I would go pick up the sick kid. Um, so, and that meant that I, didn't do as much work or I didn't take care of my spouse quite as well as I took care of the kids. But those, those are the priorities and you, and, and you know, know what they are and understand them. So ask for help, know what your limits are, be, and help us to be proactive. So if the, if the doctor or the medical team is forgetting something um, or you tell them about five symptoms and they only talk about four of them and the fifth one was actually your biggest concern, say so, speak talk. So um, just a few minutes about the idea that the disease progresses. 
Um, and uh, you don't just see the doctor once. Um, one of the joys to me of Huntington's disease is that I have an ongoing relationship with patients and families for years. And as I get older, for generations. Um, so, you know, see the team annually, or maybe they'll want six months. Um, um, and ask to see other team members as, as the disease progresses. Um, Gee, doc, I wasn't having swallowing trouble before, but now I am. Maybe I need to see the speech pathologist now. Or can I talk to the social worker today? So the, your situation may change, as I mentioned before, work or disability, driving, managing your finances. And then who's going to be there with you? And that may also evolve over time. So uh, your uh, son who used to be 15 is now 25 and is a young adult who has the wherewithal to, to actually help. So rather than you raising the kid, the kid is there to help you. Things that weren't important before may become important as, as time goes on. Medications that you didn't need, maybe you do now and vice versa. Support groups, heck, I didn't want to go to a support group. I don't want to see all these people with Huntington's disease. Well, now I'm at a point where I kind of would like to see some other people and kind of figure out how they're dealing with the middle stages of the disease. And then information changes. Um, you know, we, we research studies come out or new doctors come to the clinic or new medications become available. And, and so as you um, stay connected over the years, um, you can take advantage of these things. There comes a time where people with Huntington's disease really need um, supervision. Uh, there comes a time where they really need hands-on care. Who's going to do this? Where is it going to be done? Think about this ahead of time and plan for it. Um, who's going to make decisions? That's that healthcare directive. Who's available to help? Do you have 15 siblings who are all going to help out one day a month? Um, or is there nobody available? You're living on your own. Um, so, so what are your options? And then as, as people move to late stage Huntington's disease, there, there are medical complications that happen. So, so often um, reconnecting with a uh, sort of more general medical team um, to help on these, these sort of medical complications, weight loss, choking, pneumonia, infections. It's not usually going to be the Huntington's neurologist who's prescribing uh, antibiotics for your pneumonia, um, injuries from falls. So these are things that to sort of keep in the back of your mind that may happen in the, in the future. Um, and if they start happening, you know, that also might trigger you to say, oh, I, I have moved from the early stages to the middle stages, and maybe I'm now moving to the late stage of this disease. What about a feeding tube? What about hospitalization? Have opinions about these things as you move to the end stage of your disease. Do you want these things? Or some people say, you know what, I just like to be at home and I don't wanna to go to the hospital. I don't want tubes and stuff. Um, I will eat with my mouth the best I can. And if I lose weight and I can't eat, then that's, that's natural. Um, hospice is a, is a concept of care that I think can be very helpful as people move to the end stage of their disease, whatever the disease might be. Um, what do you get when you get hospice? You get people who are familiar with this stage of life. Um, it's a stage of life that is very uncomfortable for most of us lay people. Um, so to have a nurse to come in who says, oh yeah, this happens sometimes. Here, let's do this and let's roll over here and here's a band, you know, whatever it is they do. Um, it's, it's just, it's very helpful to have somebody who can uh, be on call for you and get very practical help. Um, brain donation is still a useful thing. Um, we, um, and, and again, it's something if you are inclined to do such a thing, the more planning you do ahead of time, uh, the easier it will go. And I, I'm pretty sure HDSA has, because I just looked last week, has information on its website about, um, about accessing brain donation. So I, I always say, um, you know, all, all my patients um, uh, die in the end, because uh, we have not yet found a cure for Huntington's disease. But I have more amazing people in Minnesota who've done more amazing things. And, and I, I, there must be similar amazing people in every state. But I, what I always say is if you give people a firm piece of ground to stand on, which is what I think our clinic does, then they will go off and do whatever they're good at, whether it's being in a research project or organizing a hoopathon or a dinner, a fundraising dinner. I had a 
a, a young lady who at age 12 organized a fourth grade fun run and now it's 15 or 12, 10 years later and she's in college and she just joined our chapter board. Um, I had another uh, family member who started a global HD organization. I've had patients give speeches to national audiences and international audiences. I have a, a colleague who does a HD blog. I had a family that opened a group home for people with Huntington's disease. You know, there's whatever it is that you're good at, um, if you have a firm piece of ground to stand on, you'll, you'll go off and do wonderful things. Uh, and maybe it's just raising your kids. You know, when the, when the going gets tough and you commit your energy to, to your family, that's outstanding. Um, but I, I, again, I've had people who've done amazing things for the broader HD community, which is also amazing. So here's, here's what somebody looks like who's uh, happy. Um, uh, this uh, young lady um, uh, wanted to go to Florida. It's a big thing in Minnesota where we're sort of landlocked. All my patients seem to want to go to the ocean sometime while they still can. Um, but of course, she has this walker that, you know, how on earth do you push your walker on the, on the beach? But her husband, um, he looked this up on the internet and there are kits you can buy for 300 bucks or something to, to fix up your walker with these balloon tires. And he just figured out you go to Home Depot and for about 10 bucks, um, he figured out how to rig the, the, these wheels up. And she was just tooling down the beach like, like nobody's business. And every, every person they passed on the beach was just so amazed at this uh, walker that they had um, invented. So I'll stop there and take any questions that people have. So it looks like I, I see one question. Um, how often um, should healthcare directives be reviewed? And um, I think some, some people like to put a, a, a year on it, just you know, every year or every other year. Um, I'm happy if I even get a healthcare directive written, <laughs> um, let alone reviewed. But I think stage of disease isn't a bad thought that because your, your um, view of the world um, changes a little bit as you go through a disease. And, and um, I, I see this in myself just uh, with age. You know, I, I, maybe I used to say, oh, if I can't um, you know, swim a hundred butterfly in less than a minute, then life isn't worth living. Well, you know, I'm not even sure I can swim two strokes of butterfly anymore. Um, but you know, oddly, life is still worth living. Um, other things have come up in my life since then. Um, so, so I think stage of disease is a, is a good um, time frame. I sometimes use round numbers. So, oh, you've had Huntington's for 10 years or, oh, you're turning 50. Um, so, you know, these are sort of round numbers. Let's, let's kind of think about, about our planning. Um, how can caregivers start the conversation um, uh, about, about um, either about a healthcare directive or about things, you know, contentious things like driving? Um, uh, sometimes driving just uh, comes up, um, you know, if you've had three fender benders, it's a little hard not to talk about it in the family. Um, but oftentimes I think it's safer in the, for the family members, for the doctor to be the bad guy. Um, so, um, to do is I occasionally have families who call before the patient's appointment and say, you know, we'd really like to talk about driving, um, but we don't think he's going to want to talk about driving. So could you bring it up? Um, and so I, I dutifully will sometimes do that. Um, I, I think if, if the healthcare directive discussion is just sort of part of the routine, you know, we, you're new to the clinic, let's get you to see speech therapy, let's have you meet the social worker. And when you come back in six months, let's think about a healthcare directive if you don't have one. Um, and I, and I, so I think sometimes the medical team can sort of help. As far as healthcare directives, if you go to a financial planner, I think it seems like often the people who are doing your estate planning or writing a will will also sort of talk about doing a healthcare directive. Um, and I know some um, faith organizations will, some churches will have, um, uh, people who are sort of trained in facilitating those conversations. Uh, another question, is there any um, uh, research currently enrolling for pre-symptomatic HD that you would recommend? And the big, huge uh, global 
study that is thrilled to enroll pre-symptomatic people is the Enroll HD study. So that's a, um, it's, it's not a trial of a medication, it's an observational study. So people come once a year and um, have neuro exams and little cognitive tests and blood draws and things like that. Some sites they have additional testing like uh, that they can choose to do or not, uh, like spinal taps. Um, and I will say this more in the next uh, uh, next presentation. The Enroll study has been um, unbelievably helpful um, in moving clinical research forward. It itself is not a clinical trial of a novel drug, but everybody who's planning trials of, of novel drugs is using data that's obtained in Enroll or recruiting patients through sites that are high enrolling Enroll sites. Um, uh, and Enroll really wants, and all of the studies really wanna get these earlier um, folks in. Uh, let's not wait until you're overtly diagnosed with Huntington's disease. If, if you know you have the abnormal gene or if you're even at risk and don't know whether you have the abnormal gene or not, you can participate in Enroll HD. So yeah, we, we would love to have uh, everybody participate in Enroll. If there's not an Enroll site in your town, um, think about whether you could make the commitment to go once a year to whatever the closest enroll site is. Or if you, you know, if you have a family member in San Francisco or something, you could go visit that family member and do an enroll um, visit uh, at that time. So, yeah. Other questions? One of the questions that people often ask is um, how do you how do you uh, find a nursing home that will take people with Huntington's disease? And I'm, I have, am challenged to answer that question because it's a non-issue in my state. <laughs> um, so I have a nursing home that has a 30 bed unit specifically for people with Huntington's disease. We have um, two different families, three different families that have set up um, for people with Huntington's disease. Um, and, and we've also groomed a few other nursing homes or kind of assisted living boarding house kind of facilities over the years um, to sort of work with our patients. And so it's, it, it's, it's kind of a non-issue in Minnesota most of the time. Occasionally there's a particular patient that we have trouble with. Um, um, and I'm, I've, I gave a presentation to a group in South Dakota recently, and the one question they all had is, um, no nursing home in the entire state of South Dakota will take somebody with Huntington's disease um, just because of the word Huntington's disease. Um, so I'm trying to work on that a little bit. I haven't, it's, it's a slow process, but we'll try to work on it. Um, so. Next time, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to talk more about um, a little bit about um, a little bit about sort of research things. So, so one is how how did we ever come up with the drugs that we use to treat Huntington's disease? So that's sort of one part of the conversation. But I, I think the piece that people still are wondering about is the the recent research studies, the the Roche and Wave trials. Um, and what what happened, and how do you how do you reboot? And isn't this doesn't this mean failure? And aren't, is is there any hope? And um, yes, the answer is that there definitely is hope. There's a lot of um, we will learn from these um, uh, um, unsuccessful trials, um, and we'll make better trials in the future. So that's my little teaser for my next presentation. Thank you, Martha. That was a uh, really fantastic. Um, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. And um, I really found the, um, the part about disability really uh, enlightening, particularly the part about part-time income. Because I don't think a lot of people really realize that uh, Social Security and disability look at your work record 
and how much you earned as a determining factor in how much disability you're going to be eligible for. So that was a really fantastic nugget of information to give to folks mm -hmm. who really are kind of on the fence of, should I continue working part-time and struggle through it? Or, you know, is it time for me to, you know, now say I can't remain longer? Yeah. The, the analogy I often use um, that people in Minnesota understand immediately um, is, you know, why on earth did the um, famous quarterback Brett Favre ever play for the Vikings? Um, you know, he played for the, the uh, uh, Green Bay Packers for his entire illustrious career until the last year. I think he went to New York for a year and then he was in Minnesota. And, you know, he should have gone out when he was on top. You know, he was king of the world in, in Green Bay and, and, you know, had obviously been through the, the pinnacle of his career and to sort of drag on for another year or two um, playing for <clears throat> a second rate team like the Vikings. Um, it, it just, it didn't add anything. Um, it just got him beat up worse. And the same is kind of true for, for people working at a less illustrious job. You, you sort of, it sort of makes sense to go out on top, to be honest about the fact that, you know what, I just cannot perform the way I used to. And I really don't want to dribble on, drag on, um, do a lousy job, have people sort of whispering about me in the break room. You know, I want to go out at a time when I, uh, when I'm, you know, up until now I've been able to work, but now there are things I just can't do anymore. Let's be honest about it and be done. So anyway, so I, I should stop because uh, our hour is up. Well, I do want to thank you again for the presentation. I want to remind everyone that you can uh, register for the HTSA convention. It is free. We are offering three full days of uh, workshops, plenary sessions and support groups. And you can register easily by going to hgsa.org. Uh, you'll find uh, a, a toolbar right there. We can just uh, click on it and register, and then you'll get instructions on how to join us each day. We have a lot of different kinds of workshops for almost every kind of uh, group that identifies themselves as part of Huntington's disease. So there's something for those who are living at risk, something for uh, those who um, are have Huntington's disease, some for caregivers. We have a very robust research uh, sessions uh, scheduled. So you know, do take a, a look at the schedule and sign up. And then uh, also remember to register for our uh, HD 303, which will be taking place on June 17th um, at two o'clock. And uh, we want to thank Dr. Nance once again for taking the time to uh, give us this great presentation. Have a great day, everyone.